thank you so much for being here because we honestly we should all be drinking beer at that time. Um, so I really appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Celia. I've been in this industry for uh, about 10 years now. Uh, I've been working at Ubisoft, LucasArts, and I've been at Epic Games for the past four years. Uh, before I start, I would like to warmly thank you for the from the bottom of my heart because uh, this is the first, the third part of. Uh, a gamer's brain trilogy, uh, and I would I wouldn't be here without uh, without you all, uh, without your feedback, without your encouragement and your support. Um, so I'm really honored to be a part of such an amazing community, um, and that you find my shit interesting. Um, so thank you very much. All right. Um, we, I'm going to do a quick explanation about cognitive psychology principles and about UX uh, that I talked about in my previous talk, so I'm not going to explain any of this, uh, but I just want to make sure that you have the basic understanding so we can be all on the same page if you haven't seen these talks. Um, so what UX is about is all about making sure that your user is going to experience the game the way you, as a designer, as a developer, intended. So you want the image. Um, of the system, the game, to convey truthfully the experience you want to offer. Uh, to do that, we explore how a player perceives, interacts with the game, and the satisfaction and emotions elicited via this interaction. So UX takes its roots in cognitive science, in human factors, and in human computer interaction. Uh, UX principles rely on cognitive science knowledge. So this is why you need to understand how the brain processes information. Um, today we're going to look into motivation more specifically, and motivation is one of the variables influencing information processing. Um, disclaimer, this is highly simplified. The brain is not working like that. It's not in separate buckets, uh, but it's just a way uh, for me to communicate about what we're talking about. Uh, making games is very complex, and so is the brain. Surprise. All right, so the main purpose of this talk today is to understand better the mechanisms of retention. And the reason why we care uh, for free-to-play games uh, is that to make money, you need to first retain players, right? Uh, paid upfront games also care about retention because players who retain are more likely to convince their friends to buy the game as well. Uh, so retention at its core means engagement. Also, if you're engaged in an activity as a player, it's more pleasurable. So not only is good business practice for you, but it's also a good UX practice uh, for the player. Owen. Okay, so the part of UX that is more specifically relevant to retention is what I now call engageability. So I used to call this part game flow because it's a familiar concept in game, game development. Uh, however, it didn't quite encompass uh, all what's important to engage players and retain them. Uh, this is why I'm now using that weird term uh, that some of my colleagues called bullshit, looking at you, Ben. Um, and it's fair because it sounds a bit pompous, but it has the advantage of expressing uh, the ability of a game to be engaging, just like usability is the ability of the game to be used. So I like it, so maybe oh, it's going to be okay. Uh, so usability and engageability are not working in silos. Uh, they interact with each other. Oh, but just like the, the brain, there's interaction everywhere, but we're separating the buckets to make it easier to talk about. All right, so here's how I'm breaking down engageability. Uh, these three pillars. You have motivation, emotion, and game flow. So please note that this is my mapping of how to make games more engaging. Uh, it's based on academic research on one hand and on my own game uh, dev experience with various teams. Um, so motivation is at the origin of all human behavior, and ultimately engagement is all about motivation. Emotion and game flow contribute to motivation. Emotions serve motivation in the sense that they help us uh, choose the right behavior. So if, uh, if you see something that scares you, you flee. Game flow is a state of deep focus and immersion, which is a concept often used in games. Uh, and it's also important for engagement. All right, a little warning here. This talk is going, uh, I'm going to cover a lot of shit super fast in that talk. Um, the reason why I'm doing this is when you're an expert audience, uh, and you should have a good understanding about all, a lot of these concepts I'm going to present here, uh, and two, even though rewards and motivation have very 
popular topics at GDC, it's pretty rare to see these topics tackled um, having a bigger picture in mind. And this is what I want to do today, uh, giving you the big picture, uh, and I will dive more deeply into a few of these concepts for each pillars, uh, and more specifically regarding motivation. But the idea really, I want you to have the big picture rather than like look just at one thing. Um, but it's going to go fast, and uh, by the way, uh, these slides are going to be on, on my uh, blog uh, this weekend, so you don't have to write down everything. You're going to have all these uh, um, this weekend. All right. So motivation is that the origin of any behavior. Without motivation, there is no action. So it's critical really cool for uh, the survival of organisms needing movement to survive. Uh, therefore, it's key to understand uh, where human behavior comes from, and by extension, to understand what players, uh, what make players tick. So I'm using a tree here because we often talk about meaningful choices when referring to motivation, and games often have uh, skill trees to offer meaningful choices to players. So human motivation is super interesting, but the problem is that there are a lot of motivational theories in psychology, and I mean a lot. So this is a Wikipedia screenshot, and this is, does not list them all, like not even close. Um, so you need to understand this about motivational, motivational theories. There are countless theories that have been proposed to explain uh, human motivation, but there, a solid meta-analysis is still missing to make sense of it all. So remember that is no current consensus nor there is a unified theory of human motivation that can account for all of our drives and behaviors in a clear mapping. Uh, so keep that in mind, because we always talk about one or two uh, motivational theories, but you have to keep in mind that there's a lot out there and there's no consensus at all. All right, so here's what I propose. Um, this is an attempt to organize human motivation in a simple mapping therefore inaccurate because science is complex, uh, but to help game development to, again, help to talk about these things. Um, so here are the uh, four buckets. Um, you have implicit motivation and biological drives. Um, so basically it's um, impulses. Uh, you have personality and individual needs. Uh, so you might have heard of one of um, a personality model, with, which is ocean. Um, then you have environmental shaped motivation and learned drive, uh, drives. So basically it's behaviorism. And the last one that usually people talk a lot, uh, about a lot uh, is intrinsic motivation and um, cognitive needs. So intrinsic motivation is when you intrinsically want to do something for its own sake uh, because it's inherently pleasurable to you. Another disclaimer here. Um, uh, so, and yes, and SDT is the motivational theory that is usually named here. Uh, so these are not really separate buckets. Again, uh, they are not independent from one another, and they are not hierarchical, contrary to uh, what may be heard of Maslow uh, Pyramid. Uh, it's called the hierarchy of needs, and actually they are not uh, hierarchical. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the top two, but very, very briefly, again, just for you to have a clear mapping of it all. Uh, but I'll move on to the two bottom for the sake of time, uh, since these are more particularly relevant to us. Okay, so biological drives are very basic needs that we share with other mammals. For example, hunger, thirst, uh, need for sleep, pain avoidance, and sex are powerful innate uh, physiological motives aimed to satisfy our biological drives. Um, there's other implicit motives that also can influence our social behavior, which is more relevant to us. Um, three of these implicit drives have been more particularly studied. You have the power motive, it's one's motivation to dominate <laughs> others. You have the achievement motive as the motivation to improve on a task. And you have the affiliation motive as the motivation for close and harmonious social relationships. Um, so depending on how strong these drives are within individuals, they will influence the pleasure we feel from certain situations differently, which in turn will influence our behavior. So not everyone is super excited at the idea of dominating others, for example. So keep that in mind. If you really truly appreciate uh, to dominate and humiliate others, that might not be the case for everyone. Just a pro tip. All right, moving on to the next bucket. I told you I would just um, describe it very briefly. Um, so generally, when you talk about individual differences, we mainly think about personality. 
So Ocean, or Big Five, is about personality differences measured against five traits. Um, you see these five traits here. For example, some people uh, uh, who score high in extroversion um, mean that they are more outgoing than people who score low on that trait. Ocean model, model like all the personality model, uh, has a lot of limitations. Uh, first, it's not stable. Uh, during your lifetime. It means that uh, the personality that you have at 17 years old is not going to be the same personality that you have at 65, for example. So it's not stable over time. Also, it cannot accurately predict behavior. So it's not because you understand the personality of someone and you have a clear mapping of that, clear uh, mapping of that personality that you can predict what that person is going to do. Um, and lastly, it does not explain all of human personality. However, it's the most robust model, model we currently have, and it's uh, certainly interesting to keep it in mind to account for human motivation. For example, an individual who scores high in openness might be more motivated to accomplish a creative task than a low score on that trait. Uh, Nikki from uh, Quantic Foundry is using this model to account for gamers' references, uh, so you might have heard of that. All right, moving on. Okay, so this one is really interesting. Um, the reason is it's video games are, um, it's a specific environment that is shaping players' behavior. Uh, so these learn drive bucket is really important for us. And it's mainly about rewards and punishments. So here you are. Um, I'm going to have to describe this. It's, it's a bit boring, but after that it's going to be better. Um, so response from the environment, the game is the environment, uh, after players' action, the behavior, can either be positive or negative. When it's positive, it means that we're adding, we're adding something. Uh, the player receives a carrot or is hit by a stick. When it's negative, it, it simply means that we subtract something from the environment. We, um, uh, we subtract a stick, um, a stick or a carrot is removed uh, from players. So depending on how this feedback from the environment is perceived, by players, uh, the player's behavior will either increase, be repeated, they're going to do the action again, or decrease, stop. Uh, here are some uh, examples for the positive reward example. You kill an enemy, you get a reward. So it feels rewarding, therefore you are likely to do that behavior again. A negative reward example would be you equip a shield on you, and therefore you don't get one shot killed anymore uh, by an enemy, so we remove the pain of dying, therefore you're likely to keep that shield again. Um, a positive punishment would be you tower dive in a MOBA, you die. Uh, so if you understood what happened here, you are likely not doing that behavior again. And a negative punishment would be you commit toxic behavior in MOBA, uh, for example, you get banned from the game, so we remove the game from you. Or you did not manage to retrieve your souls and you lose them all. By extension, uh, a negative punishment could happen if you collect, say, 100 flags in Assassin's Creed and you do, don't get any meaningful reward for that. Um, so even though it's not really something that we remove some player technically, uh, if an expected reward doesn't come, it can be felt as a punishment. So yeah, I love Ubisoft, but that traumatized me a little bit, oh, getting these flags. OK, so this is just a mapping of these, uh, these rewards and punishments. Now, you have different types of rewards. Rewards can be given either continuously or intermittently. So continuous rewards is when player action is always rewarded. So that's really important for learning um, and for game feel, which we're going to talk a little bit later. Intermittent rewards is when player action is sometimes rewarded. So that's more important for sustained engagement. So let's dive deeper uh, in this um, kind, this one, because it's uh, very frequently used in game. All right. Rewards can be intermittent either based on time, it's called interval, or based on player action. It's called ratio. Both of these reward types can be given expectedly, so at a fixed interval or ratio, or unexpectedly, at a certain interval or ratio. All right, let's use some examples from games, because I understand it's getting a bit uh, complicated. Okay, so this is an example of a uh, fixed interval. 
uh, reward. So in a game like Fortnite, when you have daily rewards, like every day you come in, back in the game, you have a reward that's waiting for you. That's a fixed interval reward. Another example would be in Clash of Clans, uh, when you're starting building something or you're waiting for your reward, you have a clear uh, timer on it. So you know that after that time, you can come back and collect your reward. Um, so this is good to lure players back in the game, uh, but once they're here, you need to have something else from them to do. So either the multiple uh, rewards happening, so like in Clash of Clans, or once you're in the game in Fortnite, you have a quest that's waiting for you, or you have a message saying, hey, your friend is playing, do you want to join, um, join him or her in that game? Sometimes it can be a fixed interval, um, before removing a reward. So this is an example you have in stores. Uh, it could be, you can get that thing, um, rented to pay for it, uh, but it's gonna be removed in whatever, in 24 hours. Uh, so this, this is creating, um, uh, a, you know that you're not uh, gonna have the opportunity to have that uh, reward at all times, uh, so you, you don't want to see that window of opportunity uh, closing, so it brings you, motivates you to try to get that thing uh, before it's gone. Okay, so now a, a variable uh, interval example would be the cherry uh, bonus in Pac-Man, for example. It comes at a certain time, but you don't know uh, you don't know exactly when. You know that it's going to be here at some point, but you don't know why. Um, same thing in MMOs, uh, when you know that a certain mob can spawn at a certain place, but you don't know exactly when. It's unpredictable. So the reward appears over time unexpectedly. And a uh, fixed ratio example. So this is all about uh, when the player is doing a certain action, certain actions, um, uh, certain amount of actions. So quests, for example, skill trees uh, are example of fixed ratio. You need to do a certain number of actions before getting the reward or getting the next uh, skill. Um, progression bars are kind of um, fixed ratio. It's not exactly fixed. It's fixed because you you have a certain you know you have a certain uh, number of points that you need to collect in order to get at the next level, uh, but the rate at which you're getting these points is, is not always predictable. So it's sort of, but not entirely. And the last one is variable ratio examples. It's of course gambling. Uh, slot machines. You want something valuable to you, but you never know exactly when you're gonna get it. So it's loot crates, card packs, chests, and all, et cetera. All right, so now that we've seen all of these different types of rewards, Let's see um, how it can differently impact behavior, how it can impact player action. So, you see that uh, this, is, this is how, this is the response rate. So this is all the actions that the player do. Uh, if you look at the top left one, uh, it's a fixed interval. So you know that at some point you're gonna get the reward. So you don't really do anything until you have that window then you know that the reward is here. When the window is open, then you do the action. And as soon as you have the reward, you stop doing that action until the next time. So this is what these uh, graphs are, are saying. Um, so if you look at this, you look at all the fixed uh, type and um, you see that the behavior pauses after you get the reward. Um, and if the reward stops coming, this is really when you have a fast response extinction. If you look at all the variable wins, uh, there are the most steady response rate because you don't really know when it's gonna happen. Now, if you look at the ratio win, uh, when you, the player needs to do something, it's not just about time, you have to do uh, something, it's creating a higher response rate. And the highest response rate and the most steady of all is variable ratio. So, as you can see, uh, these different types of reward affect player uh, behavior very differently. Uh, so when researchers say that extrinsic rewards can deter intrinsic motivation, yes. But really, it depends on many things. It depends on the type of reward. It depends on the context, whether or not the person was intrinsically motivated to do the task without consideration of any rewards to begin with. If the reward is money, or if it's a verbal uh, a patent bag, is it an item that you receive, et cetera. So it's really hard to anticipate uh, what's gonna happen because it's, it depends on so many variables. Uh, also, usually you see a decrease in intrinsic motivation and behavior when a reward is introduced and then removed. And that doesn't happen that often um, in games. 
Um, so I don't know if you were at the uh, uh, session from Travis uh, Day from Blizzard yesterday, um, and he mentioned his, uh, in his super interesting talk uh, then when players reach uh, max level in WoW, for example, then it seems that the rewards stop arriving because you reach the highest uh, XP level, well, the, the highest level, and so XP don't really matter anymore. But it's not really that rewards stop arriving. Um, they're still, you know, you still receive stuff for doing uh, what you're doing. Um, but it's more that you have reached an end goal already, the max level, and you might not have another meaningful goal to work towards. So hence the importance of community events and new quests and content, because you always want the player to be looking uh, forward something. Um, this is why rewards are highly related to goals, and both must be meaningful to keep players engaged, and a reward must be uh, not an end goal, but it should be a means for the next goal. Okay. So, these are not mutually exclusive, um, the list I'm gonna give right now, and these are really broad guidelines. Uh, in practice, like I said, there's a lot of subtleties depending on the context, but consider all rewards and punishment in your game provided, because everything in your game, all the feedback that's happening in your game are either gonna be perceived as a reward or as a punishment. Always give feedback to all player actions. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in game feel, but, uh, give consistent reward for most meaningful actions. And remember that the, most, the more time and effort it's taking for the player to accomplish a task, uh, the greater the reward um, uh, is going to be expected. And an absence of these rewards um, will likely be felt as punishment. Also use rewards at intermittent intervals for player habit formation and player strategy. You can use rewards at fixed ratio to create a sense of mastery. You can use rewards of variable ratio for some chests uh, to create excitement, and remember to mix it all. So this is the reason why it's complicated, because there's so many different types and so many different uh, contexts that, uh, and variables are, uh, that are at play here. All right, so the last bucket, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, intrinsic motivation, about SDT, so self-determination theory that you probably have heard a lot because there's minimum two talks per GDC, if not more than that, that talk about SDT at some point or another. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that you know what this is. Um, so you have competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Uh, intrinsic motivation is all about the need for these three things. So competence is about a sense of progression, a sense of being in control. Autonomy is a sense of volition, having meaningful choices, uh, and being able to express yourself. And relatedness is a sense of meaningful social relationship, sh relationships, either through cooperation or competition. And when we talk about undermining effect of intrinsic reward, it can take place when they thwart one or more of these three uh, needs. So this is why, for example, we give the illusion of control to gamblers so they can feel a sense of autonomy even though the outcome is ultimately completely random. So the thing with, uh, with SDT is uh, it alone cannot account for all human behavior. Uh, you have to take behaviorism and individual needs and drives into account. Uh, undermining effect of intrinsic reward on intrinsic motivation depends on the context. Uh, some self-determination theories moved away from the intrinsic-extrinsic motivation dichotomy, and talk in, um, now they talk instead about, a f they have a focus on distinction between autonomous and controlled motivation uh, which uh, with different types of reward. So I'm gonna talk about that right after. Um, but ultimately it depends like how you perceive, how pl ultimately what the reward is gonna be, if it's gonna be a more intrinsic, more extrinsic, controlling or not controlling, uh, it really depends on how the player is gonna perceive it. Um, and the most important thing you need to remember is goals and rewards must be meaningful to players. So, the autonomous versus control um, rewards. So you can have different types of rewards that are either controlling or uh, felt as more autonomous. Let's see the different types of rewards. Uh, see, there's a lot of different types. Different types. You have one, the non-contingent rewards. So these rewards are not related to any particular uh, behavior from the player. Uh, so you have a surprise gift uh, just because the player did not do anything to get a reward. Now, you also have task contingent rewards. 
these are the rewards that you get for doing something. So either you get a reward for uh, engage in an activity. Uh, for example, you're in the world, you just accepted a quest or whatever, and you find stuff in the world. It's rewarding your engagement. They can be rewarding completion. You have to finish a mission to complete a mission before getting a reward. Or they can reward performance. So you have to complete a mission, but you get a different reward depending on how well you completed the mission. So it's an example uh, with the stars. You have to have a high performance to get all the three stars. Otherwise, you get less stars. So um, the perform performance contingent rewards that are given specifically for uh, matching some standard of excellence, excellence are likely to be experienced as the most controlling because you really have to perform something at a certain level to get uh, the reward. However, since they also can act as a feedback on competence uh, and give you a powerful sense of mastery, the negative effect on the of the control can be counteracted by the, expressions, uh, the expression of a sense of progression when there is such progression. So, in the end, rewards that are task contingent but simply given for completing a task might be felt as less controlling on one hand, but they also do not offer any perceived increase of competence and could therefore ultimately be the worst kind of all as far as intrinsic motivation is concerned. So this is just an illustration that it's uh, complicated and not easily predictable. There is a lot of stuff happening and it's, it's really not easy to have a clear understanding of it all. You need to have all these clear mapping in your head and there's no, there's no just one, one recipe that you can apply everywhere. Um, so try to uh, make sure that uh, the incentives are not trying to, well at least make sure that the player doesn't feel controlled uh, by these incentives. Which is not easy to do, but anyway. Um, Swimming in rewards. Uh, again, Travis Day yesterday mentioned that making players swimming in rewards, being generous with them, and giving them a lot of uh, uh, rewards was increasing, uh, increasing engagement, uh, which I totally agree. Like he was taking the example of Diablo 3, and they were seeing that if they're giving more rewards, players were actually more excited and felt more rewarded and were engaging more. I totally agree with that. The problem is if it's only if these rewards have a meaningful value for players. Um, so I'm gonna take the example from Paragon here, and you're gonna see what's happening after the first match that you play, so it's a match against bots, and you get a bunch of reward after your first game. It looks like that. All right, so you, you saw here that the rewards are flowing. Um, so the intent was to um, make the player feel rewarded. But the problem, the problem is that the player at some point is just dismissing all these rewards. So it could actually be perceived as more punishing or overwhelming than truly rewarding. Because at that point, the player doesn't know what all these rewards are for. It doesn't have the need for uh, looking into these rewards. It doesn't understand the value of these rewards yet. Um, so it can be really tricky to do that. You have to make sure that the rewards are meaningful to the player because if you receive all these rewards, it can be a bit, um, it, can, it can rise as anxiety because you can feel like, oh shit, I have to learn all that stuff at some point and what it means and what I can use them for. Uh, so you have to be careful with that because giving a lot of rewards, it's cool, only if players understand what they're for. So show the lock, show the purpose, show the goal before giving them a key or giving them rewards, which are means to an end. Okay, so just to wrap up this part, because I know it's a, a big part, and I apologize to go through that very quickly, but again, I really want you to have a, 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 big, a big picture of it. Um, so remember, you have to give clear goals. Um, so yeah, short-term, mid-term, and long-term, it's really important. Uh, offer non-controlling rewards that give feedback on player competence. Goals and rewards must be meaningful, uh, which means that players must understand their sense of purpose, value, and impact for the game. And uh, receiving a key reward should not be perceived as an ending point, but as a starting point 
for a new goal. So this is really important. If you receive a reward and it's the end of it, then you don't need to engage anymore. Uh, the reward note must be perceived that you get something, and with that, you're going to do something else. So meaning can also be a sense of purpose greater than the self. And this is why being, part, so about being a part of guilds uh, or factions, it's really highly meaningful. Um, so in For Honor, for example, you have uh, a faction war, this persistent cross-platform that's conflict between knights, vikings, and samurai, and you're part of one of these factions, so whatever you do in the game, it's not only good, just going to impact you, but it's going to impact your faction, so it's, it's a meaning that's greater than just yourself. Same thing in Pokemon, you have the different teams. Um, there's another game uh, that maybe you, uh, you played, it's called Nobi Nobi Boy. Uh, so in that game, the player controls the character called Boy, and, and it's just, you have to stretch its body on the planet. Uh, and the player accumulates points by how much they stretch uh, Boy during gameplay. And these points that the players earn at the end can be submitted online to Grow Girl, another character that goes out of space. Uh, the points submitted online by players um, to Girl are added cumulatively across all players, causing Girl to stretch into the Milky Way. So Girl starts on Earth, and the more players are doing their stuff and, and, and winning in their own games, it's growing Girl. Um, and it took, for example, seven years uh, for uh, Tunobi players to make Girl reach Pluto. Uh, together. So that, again, is another example than whatever you do in the game as, as a meaning that is greater than yourself. All right. So you need to consider motivation as a whole which, uh, with all its complexity to maybe be able to anticipate your player's behavior and projected engagement. So please, if you hear a simplistic one-fits-all solution about motivation, be dubious. Uh, yes, it might sound seducing to get a magic pill to solve all of your problems, but it doesn't work that way, and ultimately you could mi it could mislead you uh, if you don't consider all the complexities of human motivation. Yes, I know it sucks, uh, but uh, it's, it's the way it is. It's complicated. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to briefly talk about motivation and game flow. As I said earlier, these both elements are uh, contributing to motivation. So emotions serve motivation. When you detect a danger, you feel an emotion, fear, uh, and that gets you to run away. Like you know, I'm sure uh, emotions are critical to learning and survival because they guide us uh, through our interaction with the environment as we seek pleasure and avoid pain. Uh, but emotion is also influenced by cognition. So top-down processing involving prior knowledge, expectation, and judgment, like appraisal um, of a situation, is it changing the way uh, the emotions are going to feel. Uh, that's why presentation is important. If something looks good, that this nice bottle of champagne, uh, you expect to have pleasure, and indeed, you're going to get a greater pleasure by drinking from that bottle of champagne rather than drinking for a uh, one that doesn't look that good. Um, so this is how your cognition, your uh, um, expectation, your prior knowledge is going to impact uh, your what you feel about uh, about something. It's going to impact your uh, emotion. Similarly, if you experience something frustrating in a game, for example, such as losing a PvP match, you might attribute your frustration not uh, not to just the outcome of the match, but to the whole experience, to, to the whole gameplay. Uh, so you have to be careful with uh, frustration to the players because they can uh, generalize uh, what they feel, uh, but not to just the element that made them felt that way, but to the whole experience. And so that's the appraisal of a situation. And the interesting thing is what we call reappraisal. So appraisal can modify how we feel about a situation, helping players to reappraise their cognitive feelings might also have some benefits. So for example, instead of letting them feel bad as they see in big red letters that their team has lost and that they suck, uh, you could instead emphasize that they did better than the winning team in some metrics or that despite losing, they have improved on some of their personal metrics. Overwatch is an example that is particularly good at that. Um, and whenever you finish a match, you, uh, you see all whether you win or you lose, I tried to, lo to lose before going to GDC and, and get the picture. I couldn't lose. Uh, but anyway, it's the <laughs> uh, um, but it's, you see the same, the same screen 
uh, you see all these uh, badges that you get, whether you win or you lose, uh, and it's telling you whether you beat your career of average um, on different metrics, such as number of kills, like here, elimination, uh, time stayed on the objective area, healing that you did, weapon accuracy, etc. So this is helping you even if you lost and you feel bad, well, it makes you reappraise that negative feelings to look at, oh, okay, it was not all bad. That, uh, at least, you know, I did that stuff good, and oh, I'm getting better at this. So think about ways to do that, because in multiplayer games, there's usually half of the players that feel miserable at the end of a match. So if you find a way to make them reappraise their judgment of their negative feeling, it's really, uh, it's really all win. Okay, so in games, in game design, Usually when we talk about emotion, we talk about two things. Uh, we talk about game feel, so how it feels to interact um, with the game. And when we talk about that, we mainly talk about the three Cs, so character, control, camera. Um, we talk about presence, as uh, the um, presence experience when players have the illusion that there's nothing in between them and their virtual uh, world, when they perceive that there is, uh, they're simply inside the game without mediation, uh, about physical uh, reality, so it's all about, it's, it's, it, it means, it's, it seems real when you shoot on something because you have particle effect or you have like some, some visual effect and sound effect and feels real. Uh, so all of that contribute to, uh, to the player to feel emotions when they, when they play. Uh, so it's a, big, it's a big bucket, and that's the reason why I'm not gonna really talk about it, uh, but it's really, really important. The other one is all about bringing discoveries, uh, bringing sur surprises, uh, because this is gonna impact the level of engagement, engagement and awareness. Uh, the brain uh, usually is, uh, is as when we see something surprising, is gonna wake us all up because it might be dangerous. Um, so just overall, this is, this is helping awareness uh, to have surprises, it's not, it's not everything all the same. So just to illustrate uh, game feel a little bit, um, this is why our direction, animation, music, sound effects, all that is really truly important uh, because it's gonna make the, f the game feel good to interact with. Um, and so in Fortnite, what we do when you open card packs, we actually, it doesn't look like card packs, it looks like a piñata, which is uh, really close to the environment, the, the, the game world. Uh, and you don't just click on something, you have a stick or a uh, sword in that case to bid the f shit out of it. Uh, so it's really compelling. Uh, you, really, you really feel that you're gonna do something interesting. Um, I'm gonna show, a v show you a video of that. And you're gonna see that uh, the the eye of the piñata, uh, of the llama, is actually following the mouse. And as soon as you click on the button to, uh, to like, hit it, uh, the eyes are retracting. It's a lovely day for loot. Have at it. Ooh. Oh, I am feeling lucky. Hey, check out this nice loot! Super loud. Um, and so, what, what you saw here um, is that you, it, it's, so the red circle, by the way, it's eye tracking, that's where the, the players are looking at. Um, it's, it's really making this part of the game like a toy uh, within the game itself. So it's, it's helping game feel. Also, just like the lever in slot machines, it gives you the illusion of control to open a pack. So you, we would see players trying to hit the llama in a certain way uh, because they might believe that they're gonna get an upgrade if they do that. They don't, but uh, they believe they, they do, and this is giving you the illusion of control, which brings uh, bring you some autonomy, and it's good for intrinsic motivation. All right, um, here's another example of game feel. Uh, so in Fortnite, uh, it's an action building game and you, uh, you need to harvest a lot of uh, uh, stuff to uh, build later on. Uh, there's a lot of RPG mechanics in that game. And so you spend a good amount of time harvesting in the world, especially if the, you're the Atlander, which is the hero that goes out to harvest everything. And uh, 
When you harvest, we actually have, a, again, a mini game uh, when you harvest, and you see, you're going to see that you have a little blue target, uh, which is called a weak point, and if you hit that weak point, it's actually uh, harvesting faster the, uh, the item, and it's also each time you hit one of these targets, you hear a very nice rewarding sound, and it goes up in tone, so it's doo 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 doo. -doo. We're not, not going to be able to hear it that well, but it looks like that. Yeah, the sound is not great because all these videos are coming from playtests, uh, so it's pretty compressed and uh, the sound is not, is not uh, terrible. But this is giving you an idea of when you harvest, you have the mini game um, that it's included in there. And, uh, an example of surprise, um, so in Fortnite you, you, gather, you wander around in the game, uh, in the world, and you sometimes find some chests, and it's always uh, pretty exciting. Uh, but at some point in the game, it's fairly late in the game, this is what can happen. Not a chest! So the first time that happens to a player, they're usually pretty surprised, you know, they're like, oh, okay, what I'm gonna get in loot, they sometimes, you know, like, take a sip on their, uh, uh, whatever stuff they're drinking, and then there's, oh no, it's actually you know, a, a, an enemy and they need to do something about it. That makes them feel that actually they cannot take everything for granted in Fortnite, and so it's raising, it's raising their awareness. So surprise like that only work once, but you can do that across different uh, stuff in the game. All right, that's all for emotion. I told you it would go fast. Uh, let's look at game flow. Um, game flow is all about putting the player in the zone where it's not too easy, not too far, uh, not too difficult. Uh, I'm sure you know that already, so I'm not going to describe this in detail. Um, but there are three components to game flow that are really important. Uh, so the first one is difficulty curve. Uh, you want to make sure that the challenge is not too easy, to, not too difficult. Uh, it's all about pacing. As well, uh, you want the rhythm of the game not to be, um, the pressure not to be too strong, uh, and the stress not too strong, not too low. And it's all about the learning curve. So learning curve is really, really important. It's all about onboarding. Uh, you want to onboard the player in a meaningful way. Uh, you want to distribute learning over time. It's not like too compacted uh, everything in this, in the, at the beginning. Uh, I had a whole talk last year about onboarding, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's really, really critical. And so you know, I'm pretty sure you've seen that graph uh, many times. But one thing I want to emphasize here uh, is you don't have, like in the flow zone, it's not a straight line. Uh, because if the challenge increases at the same time as um, the, uh, the player um, a mastery is increasing as well, it never feels that you're getting better. Because if it's really growing uh, in a straight line, it's, it's not working that well. So you need to have some times when you feel extra challenged and sometimes that you feel like super powerful and you're destroying everybody. Uh, so that's the reason why it goes in waves and it's not a straight line. So you need to approach game flow like a um, wave. You need to think about it as a sawtooth difficulty progression as uh, game de designers call it. And to create situations where old ability can be compared to new ability uh, and makes a player realize that progress was made, uh, it makes them feel competent, and it's really important for motivation. Here's an example from Shadow of Mordor. Um, so you have these nasty Uruks, captains, that are pretty difficult to beat at the beginning, and actually sometimes, most of the time they're the ones who will kill you, uh, but they had all that nemesis system that you can remember, uh, you can see clearly who killed you. It's not great for uh, <laughs> reappraisal of, uh, of feelings because they're all like boasting that they killed you and they're like, hey, you suck. Um, but on the other hand, at some point, you're getting super powerful and you can kill these motherfuckers. Uh, and then it feels really, yeah, <laughs> this is really how it felt when I played that game. And it's really um, compelling because you remember how difficult it was to kill them. So now clearly you be, be, you've become super powerful and at some point you can even like, control their minds. Um, so anyway. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> you got that. Um, so you really need to give players a reference point to make them feel their growth. Because if it's growing always at the same level, you're never going to feel extra powerful at some point. So you need to have that sawtooth challenge. Um, pacing. Pacing is all about stress. Um, you need stress. Stress is important. Uh, if there's no stress at all, it's not meaningful. You're not willing to learn about anything. You're not willing to pay attention to anything. You don't, you don't have any stress. Um, so the problem is that if it's, if it's too stressful, if a situation is too stressful, um, you might be less efficient because you're losing your shit uh, because it's so overwhelming and so it, it impacts your feel of competence. So you need to find the nice balance, all about balance in, in games, um, not too stressful, but not low on stress either. Uh, to do that, for example, in Fortnite, the first time that you actually, after uh, the introduction, the first time that you can play uh, the game, we place you in a situation where it's a little bit stressful because enemies are just spawning right away, so you don't, you don't have to, you know, you can't just like hang out like that. Enemies are here. However, they are behind a low wall, so they can't really get at you right away. So you have a little bit of pressure, but it's not too much. Lead the way, Commander. get the idea. Um, so you really need a little bit of pressure, but not too much. Another example, and this one we're now going to talk about onboarding. OK, I'm going to talk a little about it, but not too much, I promise. Um, but it's really important, because if you don't onboard the player um, well, if the tutorials are not made properly, then the player is not going to feel competent, because it's going to get his ass killed. Um, so you want to make sure that this matters way more than you think. and. Um, when we, do, did, we look at the analytics in Paragon, uh, we showed that the most impactful factors for churn were related to actually lack of competence. Like people dying from towers, for example, or not equipping cards were the most uh, impactful factors correlated with churning early. Uh, so we would see in playtests a lot of core players that would tower dive. So it looked like that. Uh, so I don't know if you know that, in a MOBA, you need to destroy towers, uh, but the towers, uh, you're going to get aggro from the towers if you don't let minions get in first, or if you're trying to destroy the tower, to, just, to actually try to um, aim at some uh, enemies while within the radius of the tower, then you get the aggro to you. And this is something that would, would happen over and over and over again. We had players that were core players that would do these things because they didn't know exactly all these rules, that the tower aggro rules. So what we did later on is uh, we uh, had a tutorial level where we uh, teach a little bit about the towers and tower aggro. And when we, once we did that, we saw that retention uh, got a little bit higher. So it's really, really important. And this is where you know, the top five issues that we saw in UX testing, so what it's all about understanding the game, all about you being competent in the game. These were actually, months before launch, were identified uh, as later on as the most impactful factors for churning. Uh, so keep that in mind. Like It's really important to nail your tutorials. All right. Um, yeah, that was the game flow part. So this is all that we saw today. I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. Um, I'm going to try to at least. Um, so retention, engageability, is all about um, motivation, which entails managing goals, uh, so quests, events, and rewards. But not only. Motivation has a lot to do with moment-to-moment -moment emotions. So this is all about game feel and surprises. Uh, it's also mostly about feeling competent uh, and a feeling a sense of growing mastery. So game flow, and especially onboarding, is really paramount. And for all these things, usability has actually a critical impact 
on all of the above uh, because it impacts the level of friction and the sense of being in control. If you have too many usability issues, it's likely that players are not going to feel any sense of mastery. Uh, if they don't understand the value of certain rewards, they actually don't even see, perceive that they're receiving a reward. Uh, if they don't see that there's a new goal, or they don't understand why they need to do whatever, uh, it's certainly not going to help their motivation. So please do not neglect usability, because usually a lot of problems are actually there. Uh, it's not that the, there's motivation um, a design missing, it's that the players don't understand it. So it's really critical to engagement too. Um, and if you, I, I don't know if you um, noticed, but um, the command lady here uh, is you always have to think about what is the meaning for players. Like really, truly, there's one thing to remember is always think about the meaning for the players. Why would they care about your goals that you're setting for them? Why would they care about that reward that you're giving them? Is that a, is there a purpose for them to get it? Do they understand the value um, to get it? So let me take one last example to illustrate this. Um, and it's also illustrating how to find out what's going on in your game. So when you identify an issue in your game, for example, when you're designed uh, for uh, the loot, all the nice math that you're doing, it's actually not really perceived the way you intended uh, by the players, because when they uh, say about you know, how they felt about the loot, if there was compelling or not compelling, uh, it's not necessarily uh, working the way you intended. So a few things can happen here. You have three main possibilities. Either something is missing in the design, uh, one system has not been implemented yet, so it's fucking everything else, the balance is off, et cetera. Um, so this is when it's difficult, because until the system is here, you can't really see how players react. Uh, or it could be here, but it's not yet balanced well. And the last uh, possibility is the systems are all in well balanced, but they're not conveyed properly to the players, so they cannot really perceive uh, the true value of it. And so when that happens, you need to figure out what's going on and where, uh, where, is, the, where is the problem coming from. Um, do you remember when I was talking about the mini game when you harvest and you, you hit this little uh, weak points? Um, actually, I'm going to talk about that first. Um, so in, in Fortnite, we have a, one of the feedback that we get from players, and they feel that it's too grindy. Um, you have to harvest well in Fortnite, but they really have that strong feeling that uh, it's taking too much to grind, to, uh, to get all the stuff, etc. And if you look at just the, the signs and feedback when you uh, harvest, you see that each time you hit something like a car, for example, you see that there's one material popping, it's metal. So you get that you um, are getting metal from the car, but this is the biggest thing that you see, it's the closest to the reticle, and you just see one piece of metal. But in fact, you actually just, with one hit, you're actually getting like 13 of these pieces. So it might be that just the players are not truly understanding that each time they're harvesting something, they're getting way more than they actually perceive just because uh, it's not clear on the feedback on screen. Uh, and we also had another problem for a long time with the uh, weak points. Um, so when you saw the player like hitting the weak points and it was uh, truly um, rewarding, it actually took us a while to get there. Um, at the very beginning, the weak points uh, looked like that. It was yellow. Uh, and this is what we would see players do. Not hitting the weak points. Don't care, nope. So what I initially thought was, okay, this was probably just a usability problem. It's not perceived as something you need to hit uh, because it looks like a feedback, like, yeah, you're destroying shit and it's the same color, you know, it's yellow. It's usually the color that you show like you're damaging something, it's yellow, orange. Um, so what we did uh, is we changed the color of it. We changed how it looked like to make it feel more like, hey, you need to hit that stuff. Um, and so it changed and now it's blue. Uh, it's way more in your face and this is what happened. Still not hitting it. And so this is like, like, what's going on? Like, it's right in your face, it's blue, why don't you hit it? And when we are asking players, we were just showing the little hit point, uh, the weak point, and we are asking them, what do you think that is? And they were saying, well, it's just saying that I'm targeting that item when I'm harvesting. 
And we're like, oh, okay. So in the end, what the um, designers did, uh, the team did, is instead of having that weak point from the get-go, uh, you would not actually have it at the very beginning. You would have to unlock it in the skill tree. Uh, at some point, you get a mission, and you need to unlock this thing. You see it in, this, in the skill tree, you pay for it, and then you see what's going to happen, and then you get it. And this is only when uh, that the players truly understood the value of this thing because they experienced what it is to harvest before getting that thing. We made it more meaningful to get that thing. Uh, and so therefore, they immediately understood what it was for. We gave meaning to uh, the weak point. And this is when we solved that problem. Uh, so you always need to think about the purpose and you always need to give a reference point to the players before giving something uh, that is cool. So the real challenge, um, usually in games, uh, is to find the real issue before you can actually solve the problem. So having a clear overall mapping of player engagement, know all these ingredients, and have hypotheses at the beginning, uh, which you can test as you develop the game, uh, will help you identify the real issues and fix uh, them appropriately. So we always think, uh, we always talk about players' motivation, um, but what about game developers' motivation? Um, intrinsic motivation is important for creativity. Guess what happens when you are given a motivation recipe that you have to follow? Uh, when games end up being all the same, so players can now see the matrix, uh, and everything is too predictable. Uh, the brain likes some changes and surprises, and uh, so you don't have that emotion uh, if it's too predictable. And the other thing is developers feel less volition creating the game. Uh, therefore, they don't put their heart and soul in it. Um, so even if there was a secret sauce or a perfect recipe uh, for game engagement, there isn't. But even if it were uh, existing, game development is mostly a creative endeavor. Uh, so developers need to find their own recipe to be motivated and ship quality. So the ingredient approach works better for uh, innovation. And so as UX practitioners, we are here we're only here to provide guidance. We can provide game developers with a methodology like user research and guidelines such as these UX pillars, the ingredients that are important for offering great user experience. But in the end, it's gonna be up to you to make your own recipe. And that's it for today. Thank you. All right. I talked a lot, but there's still five minutes for uh, questions if you want to come up to the mics. Hi, Celia. Hi. Great talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, hmm, how do I want to phrase this? Difficulty adjustment in a game that applies to like a wide audience. <clears throat> so an example would be like an Uncharted. If I'm wandering around and I'm lost, it'll put like a little tip on the screen and say, you actually have to go over here. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, like, when a game appri applies to a wide audience, like, how do you make that decision when you're developing the game, like, to actually, like, improve the level design versus actually, like, pointing out stuff to the person that's struggling? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so overall, it's usually a good practice to have uh, contextual tips. Uh, so you don't necessarily, depending on how complex a certain behavior uh, it is for the player to learn, uh, you can just, like, get away with it, not have a cool, a big tutorial about it, but just give a contextual tip uh, so only the players who are lost see it. Or it could be you had a tutorial about it, but at some point later in the game you forget about it, and so having a contextual tip is helping. So usually if it's done well, uh, it is cool because feeling lost and not knowing where to go can be very frustrating, and so you feel that sense of autonomy and control, you don't feel in control of the game. On the other hand, if it's happening too early, uh, it can feel controlling. Um, so the problem is that everything in game is all about balancing. Uh, so you don't want players to be lost, but you don't want them to feel controlled uh, by some pesky comments. So it's all about if you can make it more subtle, you know, try to uh, draw their attention to something rather than just having a text. It could work as well. It really depends on, on the context. But if, if really that like, they've been wondering for five minutes, uh, it's, it's better to <laughs> give them a solution so they don't stay stuck, for sure. Oh. Hi there. Hey. Uh, you talked about the motivation that having things like 
uh, clans or teams like, like For Honor with... Uh, I their... can't really hear you. What can you... Sorry. Hire? You talked about the motivation <laughs> that having things like clans can add to the game. Yep. For using For Honor as an example, the uh, Samurais and the Watchers and all that. Um, how do you manage the balance between the emotional connection to losing that battle uh, with providing that motivation for the player? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's all about trade-offs uh, yet again. Um, so yeah, if you're in the clan, it's it's always losing. Uh, it can be feel a bit hard. Um, so you have to make sure that you have ways to help the player to, like I was talking about, reappraise uh, what's going on. So then negative feelings, just like, oh yeah, your guild sucks, but hey, you're the best of this guild. Um, so it could be either that or making sure that the 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 team, if there's one that's really overpowered you give them like more difficulty, like you increase their difficulty or give them, that's, that's the reason why we have handicap in games like golf, so everybody can be at a certain level, it's not, you, you don't feel like you really, you're really a loser, or like games like Go, um, you have a handicap, so it's, it's balanced. So we can think about doing stuff like that, but it's, there's always trade-offs for everything, and you, like you say, we, we need to design for it and to think about it. Hey. I would like to ask you uh, to give me the analysis of an example I give to my students. If when you play Shadow of the Colossus, when you kill the Colossus one after the other, you understand that you are making something which is wrong. You, there is a guilt, feeling of guilty who goes all around mm -hmm. the games. Yep. And after a certain time, you understand that you are going to be punished for what you are doing. Yep. But if you want to know the story, the end of the story, you have no choice. You have to kill the Colossus. Yep. So it's very strange motivation. It's narrative motivation. I give this to show the long-term motivation in the game can be purely narrative. It's yep. an, um, but I, how you put it in the analysis of the motivation of the player. So it's a little bit different uh, because like you said, it's, it's really about narrative and it's about making you feel guilt, which is the point of that game in that, in that case. So if it's the point of the game, if it's the experience that you intend for players, then it's fine. You have to think about the trade-off, but usually you feel that towards the end of the game. Uh, it's also a paid up front game, so you don't necessarily need uh, retention as much as in free-to-play games. And it's, uh, so there's another great example from uh, Brenda Romero, like she's, uh, remember the game like Train, and you, you have to uh, make sure that you place as many people as you can in the train and to um, um, make the space uh, efficient until you realize that it's, the train's going to Auschwitz. And that was the whole point of the game is to make you feel guilt. Uh, and only games can make you feel, feel emotions like that. You don't necessarily feel guilt from watching a movie. So if it's your intent, you know that maybe the player is gonna not feel super motivated to finish the game, but it's, you're playing with that uh, feeling of, of, of guilt. So when it's the point of the game, then go for it, as, as long as you know the trade-offs you're making. Now, if it's not the point of the game, uh, you should avoid it, uh, especially if it's a free-to-play game. Uh, hi, Celia. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, happens that I work on the uh, math model of uh, slot machines. Okay. So um, it turns out slot machines, all the rewards come from the real money that, uh, that is the payout. So uh, how can we uh, apply all the theories of the rewards and events uh, when the payout and the hit rates are all fixed in the math model? Yeah, um, it's a whole different beast. <laughs> and uh, like I said, there's no real recipe. Um, I, I'm, it's hard for me to just like give you an answer just, just like that. It, it, takes, it takes a lot of different variables. Uh, uh, and any tips it's, it's on different. the visuals or the game flows? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and that lady here maybe would have some tips for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, one last question. What? No. No. If there are no more questions. Okay. Oh, you good? I thought we had all the time, but the game audio awards. What do you mean we have all the time? We want drinks now. It's just right, exactly. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone.